Paul, we've talked about the Rocketeer on this show before, haven't we? Oh, yes. He's uh, quite prolific in the comments, and when the forums were up, he was quite prolific there as well. I didn't discover this until recently. We we talked about him. He wrote really cool comments in my series on Final Fantasy X. What I didn't know until recently is that he wrote an 80,000 word behemoth into the forums at The Escapist. Um, back in 2014, he wrote 80,000 words on Final Fantasy XII. Yeah, I, I think I read that at the time because he was reposting them to, to your forums as well. And uh, quite interesting reading. It's so good. I didn't even see it when it was in my forum. I can't believe I had this solid gold in my forums and didn't read it. Ugh. Anyhow. Um, so I actually got around to reading, um, his Final Fantasy XII series, and it is so good. And it kills me that it's in, okay, it's not on the Escapist forums, it's on the old Escapist forums. Like, you remember back in the late aughts and early teens, the Escapist was under Themis Media. And then the site basically yeah. died for a few years, and then they came back, like, I think 2018 or something, and under new management and they had new you know all new back-end software all new forums so they just froze the old forums so these were forums to begin with a terrible place to post a novel like just terrible reading experience but not only that these were old outdated not linked anywhere frozen in time forums that nobody visited yeah and uh, that just broke my heart. The, this analysis is so fun and it's super useful. I'm currently playing through Final Fantasy XII and his perspective is super useful in helping me to understand what is this scene trying to do? And then he makes fun of it and I realize what the scene's trying to, trying to do. Like every scene in the game, because it's trying so hard to do this political intrigue but it didn't set up the groundwork for it so it's like you don't really understand a scene until you see it for the third time which is bad when a game is 80 hours long <laughs> like who's gonna play through this three times yeah so what i've done is well i am officially reaching out to rocketeer i i've emailed emails that i have access to but you know i know how emails work on my comment section most of them are dead. People just use them because it links to a, you know, oh, this is an email account I had at an old ISP when I lived with my parents back in 2007. That kind of deal. Right. Um, yeah. Um, my email in the comments is also really old. Like, I, it was, it's the first email address I ever got. I got it for junior college. Uh, and the professor's like, everyone go to the internet and get an email address. It's going to be important. Trust me. And boy, was he right. Uh, my first like six email addresses all vanned. I mean, they had to back in the day. You got your email address through your ISP, through your dial-up ISP. Yeah. And back then, yeah. they were just like dying and getting bought out and combining and and shifting. And so, yeah, my like first six email addresses were all gone. And so, anyway, I am officially. Like, within this, and I'll put this in the show notes, reaching out to the Rocketeer, hey, can I talk to you about these posts? I want to turn them into posts on the front page of, like, as if, you know, they were being posted. And I'll do all the work. All I need is permission. And I want to clean them up, because, like, a bunch of Unicode characters have gone rogue and turned into question marks mm -hmm. on the yeah. Escapist forums. So I want to clean them up fix all that, and then add a bunch of screenshots, just because. Because you've been taking screenshots anyway. Right, exactly. I'm playing through the game, and I'm currently just gathering up all this footage. I don't know if it's worth it me reviewing the game after he's already done the most comprehensive <laughs> review in the world. I, like, what would I have left to say? I have, like, a few nitpicks, and I think I would just put those as like columns like just here and there while his series is running but you know separate oh i see leave it 
as it stands, and then you can provide commentary in parallel, kind of. Right, exactly. So that's the plan. I'm reaching out to him, Rocketeer. The email is in the header image. It's diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Just, you know, email. Just reach out to me with an email that you're currently using, and I will, I will give you my pitch. Um, yeah, so that's the plan. So you are still playing Final Fantasy XII then? I am. And you know, the my initial impression was that I'm not so crazy about this world or the characters. But I guess the gameplay was kind of good. And now after, I mean, I've spent some time with it. I played for, I played for several days, got all the way up to Tomb of Wraithwall, for those who have played. I got there... And then I just got the itch after reading Rocketeer's series to start over because I wanted to see it all again. I mean, I could have watched it on YouTube, but I felt like I wanted to watch it. I wanted to play through it again for whatever reason. Hmm. So this weekend I started over and I and um, I just got captured for the 50th time. You know, you get captured a lot in this friggin' game. Yeah. Uh, and I am <laughs> yeah. um, just got captured with the one where we're on the... I forget what the ship is called, but it's like the giant, you're on the Death Star, basically. <laughs> Running around, deliberately setting off alarms so that, y you know, stormtroopers pour out of the woodwork and you murder them all for XP. You're, you're like pulling the slot, the stormtrooper slot machine. Yeah, yeah. That's where I am in the game right now. And so everything I initially thought of the game is much stronger now. I Instead of just not caring about the characters, I kind of actively dislike most of them. The story, I think, is very poorly told. It doesn't get good. I haven't even gotten to the point in the game where the story gets good. And, you know, I have I played for <laughs> no. 20 hours and I didn't get to the good part yet. Oh, no. And, um, but I like the, I like the combat so much better. You don't, you get kind of used to the way um, Final Fantasy is kind of a two-state thing where you're in the open world and then it'll give you a random encounter and then suddenly your party is teleported to this pocket dimension where you fight monsters. And then when you yeah, win... a little arena. Right, and then it plays a little fanfare and boots you out to the overworld. And, you know, that fade in is like five or seven seconds and the fade out is like another five seconds and you don't think about that very much you just sort of accept that as like part of the framework of the game and then you play 12 and it doesn't have that and you just sort of like it's all seamless you just fight things in the open world and it feels so much better and now going i i actually fired up final fantasy 10 because of another question in here um, which we'll get to later, but I just needed to like check something in Final Fantasy X, loaded up an old existing save and ran around and set up a few counter encounters and it did these, the screen shatters and then the camera swoops in on the arena and then the monsters are revealed and then, you know, the music kind of shifts to the main battle music and I was like, that's super annoying. <laughs> it's just this weird ultra repetitive like it's not needed i don't need that exact yeah, music it used cue. to be it was covering a loading screen right right exactly but we, we haven't needed that in years e and um why does it need to take so long and it makes no sense and so yeah final fantasy and final fantasy 12 the entire leveling system is so much more interesting than the sphere grid on 10. oh my goodness i mean the license board is not great. Uh, I'm uh, for the record. I'm playing on the Steam <laughs> version, which has a lot of fixes. Like you can see stuff you haven't unlocked yet. You can like scroll around the license board and see square. Mm. It, it provide. It shows you this big chessboard, and in the original version of the game, you had no idea, like what's out there. You have to like, oh, you have to buy a tile on the chessboard. And then the ones next to it will be unlocked. And so you're, if you're like, I want more hit points, you just have to like grope around on this board until you find a square that gives you more hit points. 
And it's like, oh, here's one that makes potions work better. And I'm like, I don't even use potions. <laughs> Why am I groping around for the things I need? In the Steam version, they fix that so you can preview where you're going and make and make plans and you know do strategic things as opposed to guessing or you know alt tabbing and looking on the wiki. Wow, well that's that's nice. It is nice. So that's where I am. did. I just blow a quarter of the show on that. I apologize for blowing a quarter of the show on a is this a fifteen year old game? I think it's a fifteen year old game. Um, anyway, time flies, right? Speaking of which, what have you been up to, Paul? I have still been playing Dyson Sphere Project. I got all the way to the Dyson Sphere, and then I built a whole Dyson Sphere. Uh, and there's a couple of streams on my YouTube channel if anyone's interested in watching them, which no one is because they've each got Ooh. like six views or whatever. But uh, so I got all the way to the end, and I beat the game, and then I was like, I think I want to start over and try it again. Because I could you know do how you, better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You you start off like the, it was the first time playing through the game at all, and I didn't look on the wiki or anything. I was just playing through, you know, intended experience. And uh, by the end, you understand. Okay, you need these things to do that, and you need those things to do that. You're gonna have to scale up this stuff, and this stuff doesn't have to scale up. And you kind of get a feel for, you know, I can refine this all the way to this product, but this one I have to save because I need to refine it into two different things and that kind of stuff. And uh, so now I'm doing it almost the right way. I've still got a little bit of jankiness going on, but it's um, it's much it's much better. I'm much happier with the way I'm doing it now. Right, and, uh, it's the, been fun. Knowing how to plan for the future of a strategy game is like that's one of the reasons I always want to play them more than once. You finish the game and you realize I could have done that all twice as I could have done that so much better. Yeah, and you kind of get well. At least I got kind of um stuck because my my base was all built in this weird just haphazard way right i wasn't thinking about expanding later i was just kind of building things and uh and i, I was you know building up and sideways and down and in you know getting caught in corners and you know building around circles until i'd hem myself in and all that stuff and uh so yeah yeah it's it's been fun cool that's still on the hot list. I hope I get it. I hope I get to work that game in somewhere this year. All right. Dear Diecast, if John Carmack invited you to join him on his coding retreat and offered you to teach you, offered to teach you any of his black magic coding skills he knew, what area slash subject would you choose? With kind regards, Chris. Thank you for the question, Chris. Okay. Uh, the coding retreat is a real thing. I don't know if Carmack still does it, but it used to be very common for him to go somewhere remote for about two weeks. He would just, he would get out of the office and go to a cabin in the woods somewhere with like, you know, someplace that had internet, but where nobody had a way to contact him. This was obviously begun, began in the world before cell phones. So nobody <laughs> could interrupt Nobody could barge into his office asking for an interview for Game Informer magazine. No big wigs could like, oh, we need a patch for this the new drivers on the NVIDIA and there's a problem and we need you to fix it. Just nobody, nobody could stop him. And it was shocking how much he could get done in those few weeks. Like entire engine frameworks written that you know would then endure for years afterwards like this is how the engine works and the entire skeleton of it was designed you know and most of it written in this two week retreat and that's that's my experience with coding as well just the the longer you do it the more valuable you know you put in an hour of coding you get an hour of work done. You put in two hours of coding, you'll get three hours of work done. You put in 12 hours of coding and you will get three days of work done. And it just keeps compounding. Yeah, yeah, because you're, you're holding so much in your brain at once and you're, you've got all these threads that you're trying to chase down and and keep them. It's, it's similar to writing, which we have another question about later in the show. Right. So I don't know that he still does these. 
and if he invited you to join him on his coding retreat, oh, be still my heart. Okay, well, it depends on when this theoretical thing happened. If this had happened 10 years ago, I would have wanted to know, okay, what, what's the right way to author a shader? And a two-part question, just the shader framework. What are you supposed to be doing? Because there were 11 different ways to do everything. And I could never figure <laughs> out, like, yes. what is what is the proper what is the proper language and what is the proper way of interfacing with that do you pre-compile it do you compile on the fly how are you supposed to handle errors how do you do fallbacks like what is the because the there were so many ways you could do it and they all felt a little bit wrong yeah yeah it went it had all that legacy code in there for supporting old stuff and so right and, and no one bothers to say like because there isn't one right way right but yeah right but there is there's one or two ways that the triple a places are doing but you can't find out about it from stack overflow i would have picked his brain on that um like five years ago i would have just okay i've got a shader framework i'm happy with but like what's uh, at the core of the engine the the thing that sends polygons off to be rendered i think of it as the polygon pump okay here's a bunch of polygons to be rendered with this shader and this texture in this context go okay now here's another batch what's the correct way to handle that and if i'd go and if i'd been offered this four years ago or three years ago i would have just wanted him to teach me about vulcan and like you know what do we know about vulcan so far what's the proper way to begin building something in vulcan and if you were to invite me today um i would have no questions because not because i'm this enlightened being that no longer needs help but because i've basically given up and I'm just a Unity dev now. I'm just trashed here, Unity dev. Yes, it's slow. Yeah, the garbage collector hits me once in a while. I can't control the shaders. I don't know why it's slow. But screw it, I'm not AAA. I just want to move these objects around. Just want to have fun making games. Right, right, exactly. Uh, and I just, I've sort of like come to, like in the old days, I wasn't making a AAA game, but it was really important to me that I do everything the right way anyway. And then at one point, I just gained the ability to not care anymore. And like, okay, I know this is wrong. I know Unity is not going to do the most optimal thing. And that's okay. I want to do this fun little thing, this fun idea I have. And I don't care if it's a fish. You know, I know I'm going to be wasting half the processor cycles. <laughs> I'm not going to have the threaded support. I really, I'm not going to be able to load balance across threads as well as I should. It's fine. It's fine. I'm not actually going to ship a game, so who cares? Well, there you go. So, I mean, what, what would you do at the coding retreat then? I don't know. I'd probably just um, play Quake 3 Arena with him. No, you know In what? VR. We would probably... Yeah, I would probably just want to talk VR. What's VR doing these days? What's the big new thing? Um, I'm real. I would AI, actually, though, didn't he? Has he? I didn't even know that. Oh, I think yeah, he, he I, left. I think he left uh, Oculus, and he's now doing some sort of AI stuff. Bah! I don't really. I don't even know enough about AI. I, I am no better than a common person on the street when it comes to ai i i've watched um the two blue three green channel um i forget <laughs> um on you know what is a neural network so i understand that conceptually but that's all as far as i know and that's not enough to like ask incisive questions or learn anything or do any useful work and that would just take months to get up to speed to where i could do anything with it so i would have zero questions for him right now he's in a domain that i do not know enough about to even make use of his expert if i if if i was on a retreat with him i just bug him about vr the whole time i'd, I'd ask him a bunch of stuff about um field of view I, i'm just a huge believer that uh field of view is the key thing and i'm kind of frustrated that the 
the current mid-tier offerings are all just a little too narrow. Just like a hundred degree field of view. It's just a little better than your screen than your screen. And I think the magic happens somewhere around 130 where you really feel enveloped by the world. Like mm -hmm. the Oculus Quest 2, which is what I have. Well, Isaac bought it. I think it is incredible value for the money. But boy, 10 more degrees of field of view would do it so much better. Would just be a massive improvement for just a little bit more. Just render a little bit more out there on the corners. And it would be much more powerful. I mean, a more powerful kind of, experience. Yeah. It kind of seems like the solution there is just to have a couple of really low res screens on the peripheral and, you know, and have the optics split there and just do like a real low res right. rendering on the sides. Right. If you just take a strip of like 20 pixels off the edge, if your lenses can just take those pixels and shove them off to the, to the corners of your eyesight, that might even be enough just so that you don't have black over there. Right. So that you've got movement there. Um, I wonder if you could powerful. just do it with RGB LEDs, like a little tiny array of RGB LEDs. Just take the existing edges of the screen and smear them those last 10 degrees. I wonder what that would look like. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to ask John I don't know when if... we get to the coding retreat. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah, we'll ask him when we get there. Dear Diecast, back in my youth, I was really into immersive sims like Thief, System Shock 2, stealth games like Hitman or Splinter Cell, tough round-based tactics RPG games like XCOM or Jagged Alliance 2 or the original Fallout 1 and 2, but nowadays, despite having very fond memories of those titles and having completed them multiple times over in my younger years, I cannot seem to enjoy them anymore. Not the originals themselves, nor the streamlined modernized sequels, or spiritual successors, or even masterpieces like Prey keep me glued to the screen or motivate me to boot them up again after spending a single evening with them. How come? And you two share similar experiences. Greetings from Austria. Norbert Colius Ratus, Legal. P.S. You are saying my name well enough to be tolerable. Thank you, Legal. So I've been talking a while, so you, you go ahead and talk about how you feel about games comparing to the uh, so obsessions of youth. Yeah, so my uh, my top level view of, of games are that they are a thing that is fun because they are pushing the boundaries of what you're able to learn. Like they're they're giving you information about something quickly enough that it's interesting. It's a flow state kind of uh, kind of idea. And so I think that a lot of these systems based games were fun because they were pushing your brain to learn something. Like I I just totally adored space chem because it was pushing that spatial optimization pathing puzzle solving kind of part of my brain to just really think about like every moment in this process what is going on and what can you be doing with this thing and, and why is it moving here you know and really really scrutinizing that spatial temporal relationship and uh, I think a lot of these games like, you know, like System Shock or, or uh, you know, these round-based RPGs where you've got this situation, it's really a puzzle. It's like, okay, I've got these guys and they can move in these ways and there's these enemies and know how they move and how can I optimize my formation and my positioning based on the imperfect knowledge that I have and the resources I have at hand and my understanding of the systems to solve this puzzle of how to get my guys over here or how to get the the most resources out of the situation that I can or, or whatever it is extract the most value from this situation so it's it's this very uh interesting puzzle when it's on the edge of your capability but as you grow older your crystallized intelligence grows you learn about things and you learn solutions to things and you learn general approaches and 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 things like that that will allow you to solve problems like this much more easily but also your fluid intelligence decreases you're not as easily able to learn from a fluid situation so not only are games in this genre probably uh now that we are all older getting out of the realm of our fluid intelligence to really grasp on the edge of understanding all the systems going on at once but 
the parts of them that are solvable through crystallized intelligence, through uh, knowledge of general solutions, are also uninteresting because we already know the answer. It's like, well, you know, I, I'm just going to go in there and kill all the bad guys and then pick up all the loot and then like do the same thing in the next room. And I already know, like, it's not interesting anymore because I know the solution. At one point in the past, the idea of, hey, what if one of us hardens themselves against damage and the enemy can attack them while I focus on doing damage and that'll be really fun. And this like felt like a new idea and we're all discovering how far can you push that system? What can you do with it? And, and holding aggro and now it is completely, it is not only crystallized in your mind, but it is also crystallized culturally and systemically. Everybody knows how yeah. the system is supposed to work. It is no longer being discovered. It is, it has reached its final form and now all we do is make variations on it. Oh, well, in my game, you can switch between roles anytime you want, you know, but it's still the same three roles of healing DPS and what was it? Healing DPS and what do you call the tank? Just tank. Tank, yeah. The, the tank, the healer, and the, the cannon or whatever. Right. And, you know... Oh, in my game, you know, the the proper balance is two people on DPS for a four-person part, you know. Oh, wow. Right. This is really blowing my mind. It's the same thing, but slightly different. And I do yeah. think, like, it was, yeah, it was, we were discovering the hobby in the 90s and, and in the early aughts. We were right. inventing it. Right discovering it developing it and learning it all at the same time and it, and and we and like we in the sense of as individuals but also we in the sense as the the hobby as a whole was discovering itself exactly yes and now it, everything's more calcified oh this is an open world survival game with crafting this is an rpg with dialogue trees this is a third person RPG with dialogue trees and hot bar based combat or whatever. Not hot bar, cooldown based combat. Or this is a souls like. And our vocabulary is actually, I think, gotten smaller because the possibility space was just so enormous. It's like nobody knew what was possible or what was good, and we were sort of groping around trying to find. Well, what if we did more of this? What if we do? Oh, wow. People really didn't like that. Okay. We're not doing that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But now we've sort of found the, for one thing, games cost so much. And we found the six or so templates that sell really well and are broadly um, appeal to everybody. So instead of discovering the new hobby and you picking up a game and having no idea what it was going to play like, like it wasn't. You know, back in the day, you just didn't know. I didn't know what what um, the crafting system would be like or, or what. Um, I'd never played a, uh, an MMO before Dark Age of Camelot. No idea what the experience was going to be like. So that was discovery. If I played it today, I'd be like, oh, wow, this is ass. <laughs> but at the time, it was just this frontier of discovery. Um, yeah. So I think this is normal. I think I think this happens as Paul suggested as you become an adult this is natural and then I think also in addition the hobby as a whole has sort of come into itself and become you know more calcified and we know what genres we like and we know what the genres play like and there's much less mystery in every new game except for whatever reason minecraft no one's still right the, like no one's made a genre out of that somehow right i remember having no idea what deus ex was gonna I mean like like oh it's a shooter but like there's all this crazy stuff you could do and walk around. Like I can walk in the front door and everybody will shoot me or I can talk to this guy and nobody will shoot me. And what would happen if I just stacked up this, bo oh wow, I can get back here. Like I'm supposed to hack this door, but I could just stack up this box and hop over it. That's crazy. 
is did the developer even intend that or am i out you don't even know what the developer intended you don't know what the system can do and you don't know what it was supposed to do right. so you really you, there's a certain feeling in modern games that you are within the intended experience okay i'm not fighting these guys i'm sneaking past them but that's okay that's a, a sanctioned gameplay that's a the game developer made it so that i didn't have to fight everybody this isn't an exploit i haven't secretly found a way to avoid playing the game and to sneak past everything and cheese my way through it no stealth is a gameplay mechanic you know right that you're doing they talk things. about it in the tutorial right they, they'll tell you how to do it and how to understand it so you know exactly what to expect but back in the day you didn't know what was gameplay and what was just you discovering shit on your own and that sort of uncertainty that you were pushing at the frontier made it a lot more interesting or it made it interesting in a way that covered up for the jank of the day <laughs> all right hey Seamus Paul and the comments section um, I'm gonna skip the first paragraph here most of it, this is about music and games most of the most emotional scenes, whether it is sadness or excitement within games, are accompanied by outstanding music. And yet gamers, reviewers, and journalists rarely bring up music within the genre. Why is there such a blind spot for this portion of our hobby? Chris slash Gatsu. This is an amazing point. It should have been obvious to me. Especially the, the question last week is, you know, games that made you cry. Mm-hmm. Was that last week or the week before? I forget. Whatever. Games that made you cry. And yeah, all of the... Now, I, I don't like limiting it to just crying. As if, oh, no, no water came out of your face, so you're not having an authentic emotional reaction. Like, I don't want to set the bar that high. <laughs> I feel like that's kind of unfair. Right. So, I will just say, become emotionally... Every, every situation where I found myself deeply affected by a game in terms of sadness or melancholy or characters sticking with me um, was indeed paired with music. Now there are other emotional states like, you know, if the game developer says something that I find deeply offensive. Um, I remember in the original Prey from 2006, there's a the ghosts of children attack you so you're taking your guns and you're shooting children and i was just i had a very visceral reaction to that of like anger and disgust and just but that was not keyed to music but that is the exception most of the time when i'm having a moment with a game it is connected with music i don't know have you have you found that to be the case too paul Oh yeah, my one of my good friends uh, from home, childhood friends, uh, is a musician, really good, skilled musician. Does recording, uh, does composition, all that kind of stuff. And he did the all the music for all the major movies that I've, you know, little projects that I put together. And uh, it is just you cannot overstate how important it is to have good audio for for your for your visuals like the visuals will not carry any any pathos until they are 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 heard as well as seen right if you have a the image that pops to mind for me is highway 17 in half-life 2 it's very quiet and very foggy you can change the entire texture of those scenes by changing the music over them you could make some warm like Oh, we're away from the city and we're safe here and it's good and it would it would take on a welcoming feel which would then feel dissonant when you tried to go into one of the houses and it was filled with black head crabs yes. or or you can do the the horror you know have a really um horror sounding music very suspenseful and you would be like i don't want to go that how to that house i can just tell something bad's gonna happen there um, but the but the way they went with was instead sort of a forlorn desolation. You feel alone. It was sort of thoughtful and melancholy music. Now, those are all three 
totally valid. But the point is that the visuals alone, like you said, Paul, were not the mood. The, the visuals were really important, but then it was the music that saw, and the music that wasn't even there all the time. You would enter an area and you would get some music to set the mood and then the music would piss off. I think that's another thing is not wearing music out like um, Bethesda games will often just have the music loop incessantly until I feel like I'm losing my mind. I usually yeah. about, you know, 10 hours into a Bethesda game, just like suddenly realize I, I need to turn the music off. This is making me crazy. Just this same loop going on forever. Yeah, um, Dyson Sphere Project does the same thing. Oh, yeah, that's rough. I want to offer a few examples of times where music really like I think if I wa if I took in Final Fantasy X, but I turned off the music, I would have had a very different. I think the entire experience would have been very comedic and I would have giggled a lot <laughs> because, right. you know, everybody's dressed so ridiculously and the, the stuff they're doing is so stupid and weird. And, they, you know, Lily, hey, everybody, let's gather up sports equipment and go fight God. Yeah. <laughs> But and the, music... the timing is always so weird when they've got the pre-rendered visuals and then they have to dub English over them. So like the timing's all wrong yeah. for the language. And yeah. oh yeah, and that's always a, a layer of like mild comedy. But two themes in particular, two Xanarkand and Yuna's theme both get me every time. Just even if I'm not playing the game, but if I am playing the game, if I, well, I'm wandering around um, Besaid Island. And I hear Yuna's theme come in. I'll be like, oh man, this place. Oh, the time I've spent here on this island. And it feels like this place that I've visited and these people that I know. And to mm -hmm. Xanarkand, to Xanarkand, I'll link this in the show notes. To Xanarkand is powerful and haunting. Oh, and it's right on the threshold at the ed, end of the, well, not at the end of the game, but as you reach the fabled lost city of fallen Xanarkand from a, that's been dead for a thousand years. And the music really fits that mood. Uh, yeah. Those, the, but even in a not, music can even save a game that isn't otherwise working. For me, Bioshock Infinite was an absolute disaster of like cross purposes and thematic and emotional elements not working like it just wants it wants to be a blood and gore shooter while talking about oh, how do i describe it it's somebody that wants to discuss um you know what makes this you know the concept of self like the so you know the the game soma you know, what is you and how do you differentiate mm. between you and something else that thinks it's, you, you know, that knows what you know and like, what do you call yourself and what are you? Somebody that wants to have that philosophical argument while, you know, watching a Michael Bay movie. And <laughs> that's what... You'd have to that's how, definitely turn the music off on that one. Right. That's how... Bioshock Infinite just felt it wants to talk about racism and fate and religion and it's swinging around all these heavy themes but it's just like all over the place it doesn't know what it's doing with any of these it's it's themes are a couple of six shooters that it's just shooting straight up in the air while it's you know yeah <laughs> just <laughs> absolutely not aiming at anything just shooting <laughs> but Having said that, there's a scene where you go to the basement of, I, I think it's a bar or whatever, and you see a guitar and you pick it up and your character plays it. And Elizabeth comes in and sings a song with you. And it's still this wonderful mo I had a moment there. Even though the scene, ma scene made no sense in the world. The music, the atmosphere was right, the lighting was warm. There was a precocious little kid there, um, and it was a sweet moment. Even though it was so disconnected from the rest of it, I was still able to connect with it emotionally. That's how powerful music is, is that it can take a game that is not working and make it kind of work. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very important. 
So yeah, I I feel like I've been overlooking this too. Like the point that Gatsu Chris makes is that why is there such a blind spot for this? And I'm not sure. Why do we? I I've been overlooking this. Yeah, yeah, it, it happens in movies too. It's the the saying is if you don't notice it, it worked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's really clever. And it's, it's it's super true. It's true of visuals too, but it's doubly true of of audio. Like you don't want it to stand out. You don't want it, if it's done really well, you won't even you won't even realize it's happening. It's just there in the background. How much does George Lucas owe to John Williams? Oh, yeah. Well, I think he's paid his bills, but yes. Right. But like you know, how much of that success, if you took that out and replaced it with a more standard movie soundtrack, how how much damage would that do? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. The Star Wars music is iconic. Yeah, I can't, I honestly can't judge. I heard it when I was six years old. So I'm literally incapable of like looking at it objectively. I heard I... it when I was my most vulnerable to that particular kind of music and for me that was the music of adventure that was the you know the star wars theme was the theme of adventure so and everything else gets compared to it somewhere in the back of my mind all right whose turn is it do i go first you go first i think it's my turn dear diecast as an australian i was very much amused by seamus take on an australian accent even if it did sound more like a distorted working class British accent, which seems to be fairly normal for Americans trying to sound Australian. I would be very interested to hear your take on other countries' accents as well. Ah, oh, yes, an Australian throwing everyone else under the bus. Best wishes, Henry Chadbin. Yeah, for the record, that quote-unquote Australian accent is really... I, I talked about this in the comments. It's a riff on paul hogan paul hogan was famous in the 80s it was like america discovered australia oh wow there's this country that kind of talks like we do except they're really different and they've got you know marveling at this strange exotic culture which is really our culture with some very very minor tweaks um right well, yeah, it's, it's British culture, right? But then, like, we split off from right. British, and they split off from British on the other side of the world. Right. And so Paul Hogan came over, and then for a few years, everybody was doing the Paul Hogan accent. And I was very fascinated by it. How far back in the throat you pronounce some of the vowels. It sounded so... To me, it sounds very distinct from British which is often high and tight and very forward in the mouth. An Australian, it's all that Australian. All of that is way back there. I realize my, my pronunciation is incorrect, but the sound of it is so, dis is so distinct. It does not sound like British. <laughs> it is hard to get your mouth to do that if you're not used to doing that. And your mouth really just wants to do the American thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't, the point I'm getting at is I don't actually do accents. Accents are hard. Teaching your mouth to move a different way is hard. I do voices and some of the voices are based around accents. Um, mm. Like I've got Pumba from uh, Lion King. I got to back up from the microphone because I can only do this one loud. It's been a while. Hakuna Mutata. It means no worries. And I've done this one before. I did it on spoiler warning. Is I'll get you get it. And that's Doctor Claw from from uh, Inspector Gadget. So those are not accents. Those are voices. And that's what I do. It just so happens that one of the voices I enjoy playing with is supposed to be. Australian but I would like to turn this around I think we're we might end on this I, I'm not sure I would like to turn this around because I in the comments last week I found something about this fascinating of, of several people are like haha that was funny or uh, that wasn't that great you know they were not impressed by my take 
but then there were sure, a few sure. people that, that that were like oh that made my ears bleed oh that was <laughs> painful to listen to and i'm like you know i've never for one thing they were policing their own accent which i think is interesting i've never heard someone doing an american accent whether an actor or just somebody who you know doesn't know, like have you um, watched you know, have you watched house yeah I, i've seen scenes of house i've i've heard um hugh laurie do his american accent and it's so much like benedict cumberbatch's and they have the same quirks to it where they really lean into the r's just to make sure like <laughs> they want to make sure they don't you know lean on. so they like extra lean into it and you can tell that's not how most people sound but i don't immediately go oh that's a terrible accent i go huh i've never heard anybody talk that way but that sounds totally valid that sounds like an idiolect it sounds like somebody's mm. peculiar um yeah an idiolect that's a good word one that's a good word yeah yeah one person's um particular idiosyncratic way of talking like um truman capote he had a very peculiar way of speaking that was unique to him richard simmons uh aside from the i don't know what's the polite way to refer to his voice that sounds effeminate aside from that there are a bunch of little quirks to his voice um i forget there are a few more there are a few more but i can't think of them right now i'll think of them as soon as the show's over anyway the point being i've never heard anything that i found th nobody has ever done my accent in a way that i found unpleasant Mm. the worst i once in a while I'll hear like oh, oh oh i heard i heard him drop an r there or oh he rounded a vowel he shouldn't but it's not painful and in fact i love hearing it i've never heard anybody doing an american accent that i thought was unpleasant um so i've never had a, the reaction a number of times lindy beige does a, an american accent and it's oh i would again it's comical but it's not like painful right i want to hear that I'll, I'll i'll have to look that up if you don't have the link i've never heard him do an american accent i would love to hear that yeah he, i he oh. occasionally drops it in the middle of his his shows i i don't know anyone in particular but yeah you can search it up but um there was, i think the reason oh. that it might be that that you and i are not offended by people doing american accents is that america is is the place in the world where it's okay to be different and it's okay to like pronounce the language a little weird like we're the land of immigrants we don't care if your english isn't great as long as we can understand what you're saying so right everybody's language everybody's english feels terrible here because it's yeah. all different yeah and there are lots of different accents within our and i'm sure there are accents within other languages as well but it seems like a lot of other cultures and and linguistic groups police their own language much more strictly i know the french do very strictly they have like an official bureau of language purity and uh and so like there are other languages that are much more i think the chinese do as well that are much more strict on what is correct and what's not correct and so even though probably that doesn't exist in australia um australia might have more of a mono pronunciation a mono dialectical culture than we do in the united states and so it's more noticeable when someone doesn't get it right because everyone else does what i have noticed the unpleasant when i hear an unpleasant accent it's not somebody doing an american it's an american trying to do another accent and they're getting it really wrong um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> keona reeves in bram stoker's dracula where he was supposedly a british guy and he was way off um that's like i don't know that it's painful to listen to but it's kind of cringy like it's cringy in the right. way that when it, somebody does a bad job it, yeah it, yeah yeah you're, and you're kind of and you're kind of ashamed also because this is like an actor this is someone we're, we're holding up as a paragon of our culture and be like look at this guy he knows how to do things and then it's like but not an accent apparently there was one somebody put in the comments last week there's a skit by a guy named Michael Spicer. He's a British guy, but the the skit that he's 
doing here is called that scene in a Christopher Nolan film where you give up trying to follow the story. And it's, <laughs> I mean, this is the classic YouTube. This is really caught on the last few years. The one person playing two different characters shtick, like, um, Alistair something Beckett and Ryan George and Matt Colbo have nothing. They are all like channels dedicated to just that form where you just, play two different characters that are both obviously you, right? But in right. this skit, Michael Spicer is doing an American accent and it's pretty good. It is most of the time like, okay, okay, that's right, that's right, that's right. Oh, you, you know, especially at the end of a sentence, he hurries through a word and he'll drop an R or something. And you'll be like, ah, oh, immediately, like this red flag sticks up and you go, wait a minute, that's not right. Mm -hmm. Um. But at no point was it painful or offensive. And it's actually delightful to hear people doing these accents. Also, I will link to this in the show notes. It is an awesome skit. It is so funny. I think uh, another aspect of the people saying that it's painful is just that, like, it was a bad accent and you knew it was bad and you did it anyway. And they're just kind of like, yep, you sure botched that. That was not good. But like, maybe in more of a lighthearted way. Right. I think the Australian one is, though, I you know, oh, it sounded like a lower class British. I'm like, to me, it sounds like the um, like the fake Australian accents that we have on cartoonish characters. It doesn't sound exactly like the sniper, but it's that same sort of like the sniper in um, Team Fortress 2. You immediately recognize that as, oh, that's supposed to be Australian. And the mm -hmm. um, doctor, the the medic, okay, that's supposed to be German. It's obviously not. It's a comedy accent, but you immediately recognize it as what it's supposed to be. And f to my ear, my Australian accent hit that note. Now, you know, probably to a native Australian, it doesn't. <laughs> it's, it's understandable. Um, but yeah, it wasn't supposed to be an accurate it was supposed to be an imitation of a comedy accent mm -hmm. those are much easier to do by the way <laughs> a real accent that can fool a native is yeah i mean you need to practice you need to you need to spend time to develop that that's not something you can pick up in 10 minutes if there's anyone who listens to air colonel detlef's house of inventions and also listens to the die cast i would be interested to hear what you think of my german accent in the comments. Wait, when have you done a German accent? It's on my YouTube channel. You can go look it up. Oh, 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 I see. I see. Okay. Um, you know what? We can do one more. The, the, we're, we're running a little over time, but this next one is super short. Dear Seamus, I hope this mail finds you in good health. Not likely these days, but thanks. It's a question about how you start writing your fiction books. What kick starts the whole process and what do you write first? Best regards, Deadly Dark. Uh... How do you start? I mean, I usually spend weeks sitting around. Okay, I spend weeks thinking about a world or characters, depending on which I start with. And then I'll do the other one. You know, I'll either start with a world and then come up with characters to inhabit the world. Or I'll start with a few cool characters and then come up with a world for them to live in. It depends on which way I'm coming at the topic. Um, and yeah. I just, I don't do anything with it. Like, if you you would not recognize this process as writing. I don't sit there and look at a blank page. It's like those moments just before you fall asleep at night, I'll think about it. Or when I'm, you know, waiting for my food to cook, when I'm taking a shower, that's when I'm working on it. And when that sort mm. of, when that sort of course work is done and I know what the story I wanted, the, 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 the mistake I made with Fall from the Sky is I didn't know the whole story I wanted to tell. And I really regretted writing half a book. And so now I insist on knowing the beginning, middle, and end before I start. So once I've got that worked out, then I just start at the beginning and, and write straight through. I know some writers like start in the middle, they write the end first, then they write some middle, then I would, I would lose track and nothing would make sense if I did that. I've got to go straight through. That's so, so that's how I write. Really, I I thought I, this would be the most boring answer in the world. I figured everybody did it this way. Yeah, well, I, I feel like a lot of people do. 
um, my process is very different. Uh, well, not super different. So like you start with whatever it is that you're starting with and you think about it and, and cogitate on it. And then you, when you start writing, you begin at the beginning and write all the way through. Is that summary? Yes. So when I'm doing a story, I will start by writing down whatever it is that I'm interested in about the story. So if it's like a scene, I'll just write that scene out. And I, it, it feels like, like eating your dessert before you eat your dinner, right? Like, oh, I can, I can totally see that. Yes. No, I don't, I can see that. I do have scenes in mind when I start, I'm like, oh boy, I'm really looking forward to writing this scene, but I don't do it first because then I won't want to write the rest of the book. <laughs> Right. That's, yeah. That's my yeah. motivator to keep me going. So, so I start there. I eat my dessert first. And I'm like, these these are the things that I'm really interested in, and then I whatever it is. Maybe it's a couple scenes that you write out, or maybe it's like a couple characters or one particular setting that's really like captured my imagination. So I'll write that out and be like, okay, I wrote that out. Now, is there anything more to this idea? Does this deserve a book? Does this deserve to be expanded into a hundred thousand words? Or is that it? Did I just need to write that down and now I'm done? And, uh, and so like at that stage, it's like, okay, reevaluate. Is this something I really want to like make into a whole thing? And, and how much do I think I can write about this? And then once I have that down, I kind of, I kind of grow an outline out from that seed. So in, in, instead of like starting the outline of the very most general thing and like working your way down, I try to like start at the specific thing and then work my way up into an outline and then flesh that outline out and like get a, a good structure. Um, and then once I've got the whole kind of framework of the, of whatever piece this is, it doesn't have to be a book. It could be like an essay or whatever. Um, then if it's long enough, I will just start on whatever I want to start on. And if that day when I'm writing, I, there's nothing that I feel like working on, then I will just, I bring up a Python script and I just have it choose a section at random. And then I just write on that. And I have to write, the rule is I have to write at least one sentence. And then I choose, and then if I still have nothing to say, then I choose another one. And I have to write at least one sentence on that, and, you know, and add at least something to it. And usually after like one or two, I'll get to a section where it's like, oh yeah, actually this is kind of cool. And, and I'll get into the groove and then I'll, you know, start writing and it'll come. So, and then that's my process. I just keep doing that. I keep either working on whatever it is that interests me that day, or if I'm not interested in anything, just whatever the next thing is until the whole thing's fleshed out and then it's done. One other note is that I've, this process of like, okay, I'm going to envision a world and characters or, you know, the other way around. 90% of the, you know, and I just think about it in the shower and while I'm cooking and while I'm falling asleep and while I'm doing other things that aren't, you know, concentrating. Moments of low concentration. Um, it's my toy idea that I, I get out and play with every once in a while. And 90% of them die before ever you know, resulting in a single character appearing on a page. I play with them and then I get tired of them and I just throw them away. Right, um, right. I just made a new one yesterday. By made one, I mean I started playing with a new idea. Um, after playing Final Fantasy for, you know, basically a week and a half, I started thinking, boy, these... It, but I was comparing 10 and 12 and seven i was comparing the old school ones where it's a bunch of teenagers trying to fight god with 12 and its political machinations that eventually also turns into a bunch of 20 somethings fighting god um spoiler but sort of like these inherently ridiculous stories that take themselves not seriously but they're earnest they're totally this is not a farce this is an earnest story where these people do these ridiculous things and yeah. i started think and i started thinking about that vibe Th this is another thing i like to do i notice almost every one of my projects is kind of a different um genre i don't want to work in that genre i get like i did that genre like the fun of writing is sort of like what about this genre attracts me and can i recreate that and capture it somehow right and that's like wanting to be a music 
you know, imagine you're a musician and you're like, okay, I want to write a, a blues song and then a rap song and then a metal song and then some bluegrass. And it's like, nobody wants this album. Nobody. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Unless it's you're really Jonathan hard. Colton. Right, right. The, yeah, unless you're doing comedy. Cause, and then you're kind of making fun of all the genres. Like an earnest recreation mm, of, of, of existing genres. It, well, you, how you're supposed to do that is Anthony from 12 Second Songs on YouTube. You just do 12 seconds of it. Okay, great. You recreated that. Done. You don't need to do the whole thing. You, and that's probably, I should do like you. I should just write a scene in this style and then move on. But instead, I want to write the whole book. So I've been playing around with this like, okay, how do you construct one of these ridiculous stories? Do you start with a premise of like, here's an outrageous thing I want to do? Or do you start with a theme? You know, here's a theme I want to talk about. Or do you start with, here's a bunch of teenagers with baggage. I will shove them together and then I'll come up with some world saving for them to do in the background of, of their bullshit. Right. And so that's what I've, yeah, that's what I've been doing for the last two and a half days now is taking that world out and playing with it and, you know, and adhering to the rules of the format. We have to visit all the biomes, you know, your, your jungle biome, and your, <laughs> you know, you have to go to a city, you know, think of it as, as if you're making a Final Fantasy game, we got to put those cutscenes in now, obviously you wouldn't do this in book form, but I'm, I'm treating it that way anyway. Like, okay, the party must be seven people. They should be, you know, these ages. We need to have a bunch of different body types. We don't want everybody to look the same. Um, and I, I sort of like, okay, that's your constraints. That's like your iambic pentameter, right? That's your constraints. Now, what can you build within those constraints? And that's what I've been doing. Yeah. It all seems like you're a, you're playing the part of a tour guide, like not a comedy tour guide, like in Disneyland or whatever, but like a tour guide who's on, who's like put together this expensive tour, people have paid money to come to this experience and you're trying to give them like the Final Fantasy tour. Right. Like, what would that look like? Here are the essential things that is, are associated with this genre. Here's what you should expect. Here's everything you probably already expect from this. It's fun. It's fun. I'll probably never mm -hmm. do anything with it, but it's so fun to, you know, play with these stories. So that took way longer than I, I thought that was going to be a two minute answer. I start at the beginning and I write all the way through Deadly Dark. That's the answer to the question. All right. Very good questions this week. We actually have a couple left over. We will save those for next week. If you have a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Back to my Dyson Sphere.